It's working now. <laughs> so uh, we're challenged in this passage to walk worthy of the calling that God has called us to. We're his children, and he wants us to behave like it. That's basically it. And in verse 1, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. How do you do that? You do that with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Because there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Lord, one God, one Father of all, who is over all, in all, and through all. So what we're heading to here is God wants his church to be unified, wants us all bound together. <clears throat> and the world is working very hard in trying to divide the church trying to take apart our unity and not make us unified. And we, we know all the things in the world that are out there that are causing not only the church to break up into fragments, but also households and also friends and also uh, people that work together. And some people have become very passionate about these things uh, with the police going to uh, arrest somebody because they don't have a mask on or a person without a mask in the store where the other people are screaming at them uh, that they have to wear a mask, or the store throwing people out, uh, and then a bunch of people going into the store without a mask and <laughs> trying to show them that you don't need one and, uh, and all about the vaccines and the certificates and all of this. Um, do, do black lives matter or do all lives matter? Uh, there's just one thing after another the church can be divided over and God doesn't like that. You know, when he calls his church home, that his whole bride is going up. Everybody that's born again is going up into the air to meet him face to face. And how will it be when two people are going up maybe next to each other and you look at him or her and you think, boy, I sure hated him. I sure hated her. Uh, some people in the church do hate one another now. That, that, that won't happen like that because we'll all have new natures. We'll be changed instantly, and we won't have a sinful nature anymore. And I'm looking forward to that one, of not having to battle this, all these thoughts and, des and desires and everything that you have to battle in this world. And that'll be gone. And so we'll all love one another forever and ever and ever. And we'll be living in the Father's house in that room that he's been preparing for us. So we just thank and praise God for that. But while we're living here on earth, he wants his church to be unified. And in the world, there is a whole movement to bring not only the churches together, churches, but all religions together. And that's what we do not want to be a part of. Because we're a part of God's family, born-again believers, the bride of Christ. And in this world a global church that is largely the Pope bringing it together. Uh, he says no religion can say that theirs is the only way. That's not allowed. So when the creator of heavens and earth, Jesus Christ, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, this new world order says, no, you're not allowed to say that. You're very hateful if you do and very arrogant. How can you say yours is the only way? And they're going to have their own world religion. And the true church can't be a part of that. But the true church has to be unified among itself. So, is it always that way? Some people say to one another, I don't want to put up with you anymore. I'm fed up to hear with you. I've had it. I don't even want to hear or see you. Or that was the last straw. That was your last chance with me. Uh, you really hurt me. I'm done with you. And I just can't take it anymore. And I, I can't stand to see you or hear you. And I'm out of here. And once more, the church is divided. The unity is broken. The church is split. 
And we can't allow that. Christ doesn't want that. And so he's telling us how not to. Last week we talked about uh, being humility, walking in humility, where each person looks at the other people as more important than ourselves. It's a selfless thing. And Christ had that. Remember Christ prayed in the garden the night before his crucifixion and rest and all of that. He said, Father, if there's any other way this, this can be accomplished without me going through this, but nevertheless, your will be done because that's where he was. He was humble enough to say, I'm not going to exert my will over my fathers and over all the people in the world that I'm dying for. He said, I'm going to die for them. And so he did. He humbled himself, it says in Philippians, all the way to the point of where he died for us. So he was very humble. And he was very patient with people. And he was very gentle with people. And so he is gentle with us. And I'm glad that he's gentle because at times when I mess up and, and do wrong things, think wrong things or whatever, I, I'm glad that he's gentle and he has lasted a lifetime with me of um, walking with him. And he's not a harsh, mean, cruel, overbearing bully. That's not God. That's Satan, though. That's him, but not God. He's gentle. And Jesus even said, I am meek, and I am mild. I am humble, and I am gentle. That's the way God himself is. The one that has such awesome power that he could just speak and say, let the earth just be full of fish. And all the waters of the earth, they're instantly full of all kinds of fish. What kind of powerful being is that? It's Jesus Christ. And yet, this powerful being that has that authority and that power, he's very gentle and he's very humble. He thinks of others before himself. It's the almighty God. What a wonderful God we have. And our God wants us to be like him. He has called us to be like him. We weren't always like him before I was saved. Uh, at probably 12 years old, I was made a ward of the court. I was declared incorrigible by the court. That means you've developed such a habit of criminal behavior that you can never change. You're unchangeable. That's what they said of me. But one day I heard that Jesus Christ had died for my sins and that he could change me. Wow. <laughs> and he did. How incredible. God changes people. And we become new. So once we maybe we're angry all the time, but now we're, we're not angry with people. That's what God wants. But, you know, we all struggle with things, and we all struggle with anger. That, that's one of them, because in the New Testament, we see it written a lot. And a lot of times the tense, the Greek tense, the verb tense, will say, stop being angry with one another. That means Christians were being angry, and God says, stop it. Put on the new man so you can live like I've called you to live, as my child, as my children. In Ephesians 1, 4, we say that God chose us. That's part of our calling. Uh, that he, present, uh, he predestined us, in verse 5, for adoption as sons to himself. We're children of the very God and creator of this heavens and earth. In Matthew chapter 5, we see this, where Jesus is teaching, and he's telling people, that they not only need to love the people that they really get along with and really like them, they also need to love their enemies. And the reason they need to do that is because they're children of God. And that's the way a children of God acts. In Matthew 5, 43, Jesus says, You've heard it said, you will love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, to love your enemies and to pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward is that? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? 
For if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. He calls us to be imperfect. Why? Because we have a heavenly Father who's perfect. He wants us to walk worthy of, his call, of our calling. We're called to be his children. In Philippians 2.15, it says, uh, Do all things without grumbling and disputing. Oh, my goodness, the church grumbles and disputes? Yeah, we do. We, we dispute about things, and people do grumble and complain. And why is all this stuff over here week after week? And how come we're still writing checks to Mason Valley? And how come that person is always whatever? I've heard so many silly things about people grumbling about one another, grumbling about anything and everything. And he says, stop doing that. He says, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God. And that's the way the children of God are supposed to be. We're supposed to be blameless. We're supposed to be innocent of these things. We're supposed to be without blemish, right in the middle of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom we shine like lights. In this twisted and messed up world where people are so angry, so afraid, uh, terrified, uh, mean, just so many mean people in this world. Um, the brutal killings that we see. Uh, a, a young man just walking down the street, and here's a lady pushing her little shopping cart and uh, her little basket going home after shopping. And as he walks by her, he just, bam, just hits her in the head and knocks her out and just keeps on walking like nothing happened. Just brutal, evil people. As believers, in the midst of all this stuff, we shine like bright glowing lights. And we are lights in this world. We are to shine the light of God's truth. We're children of God, and that's how we should be. So God says, be holy, because I am holy. It's what God's family acts like, because we are family. And he is our Father in heaven. And we're to be imitators of God and imitators of other people that are following God. Um, Paul said, I urge you, he urges us then, to be imitators of me. Paul could say he's an imitator of me. Why could he say that? Because be imitators of me because I'm an imitator of Christ. What I see Christ do, I'm just like him. So if you want to be like him, follow what I do, and you'll be just like Christ. And follow anybody that's following Christ. Imitate them. And th that's what human beings do. We imitate. Uh, kids grow up by imitating. They see what their parents do. Once in a while, I'll, I'll just look at one of the kids in the house, and I'm just drinking water. I just got the water out of a little Walter filter, and I, I'm drinking it. And I look at them, and they're just looking at me. And I'm thinking somewhere they're going to be doing what I'm doing. One time... Um, us and another couple were in a big museum, the, the History Museum in Chicago. Beautiful big place, right next to Soldier Field, the football stadium. And, and we're in that place, and uh, we were sitting down, just relaxing, taking weight off our legs. And, and I had a pair of glasses, and they didn't fit right. And they were always slipping down, and I always had to move my nose and kept trying to bring them back up. My wife said, you look so stupid when you do that. You know, you need a new pair of glasses. Just get a new pair of glasses. And, and, I, and I looked over, and there was a couple across from us, and they had a little baby in a stroller. And I looked at that little baby, and the little baby was going with his face. He's going like that. And I thought, oh, man, they're going to get home, and they're going to say, where did he learn that? <laughs> we imitate people. And Christ wants us to imitate him, to do what he does, to act like him. So imitators of the Lord, imitators of people that follow the Lord. Christ wants our behavior to be just like his, our, our Heavenly Father and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So in this context that we're looking at, we want to act like our Lord. Our Lord says, I am gentle and lowly, so we are to be gentle and lowly. And that's just what it says in Ephesians uh, 4, 2, uh, the same words. 
We're to love Christ. We're to love others because he loved us first. So when he loves us, we want to love one another. When Christ forgives people, we want to forgive too. Uh, he tells us this over and over, uh, Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, hey, along with malice. Golly, he's telling this church in Ephesus where he had been for five years. Paul himself was pastor of this church, and Timothy was a pastor of this church, and others, great men of God. And he still, he had to tell them, some of you people have bitterness in your heart. Some of you people are wrath. You're full of wrath and anger, and you have clamor, and you're slandering other people, making up lies about them so everybody will think badly of them. Put them away from you, and all of your malice, put it away. And it's, now that you put it away, do this. Uh, walk worthy of your calling. Be kind to one another, to be tenderhearted to each other, forgiving each other as God in Christ forgave you. God has forgiven us all of our sins. And has it ever happened that we see somebody else sitting and we say, I just can't forgive them anymore. I, I can never forgive them of this. Well, Christ does. He keeps forgiving us. I remember a story a few years back in the news where there was a church with people of color and a man walks into that church and sits in the service and prays with them. And then he takes out a gun and starts shooting them. And the news said, oh boy, we're, we're going to jump all over this. A white and a black, a white guy killing black people. And they went to this church. How do you feel about this evil man that, that he sat there and you prayed together? And then he takes a gun out and starts killing your family members. How do you feel about this man? And they said, we forgive him. And you didn't hear that story anymore <laughs> because they forgave him. They said he needs Christ. He needs to be saved. Uh, when Peter, uh, Stephen was being stoned to death, he said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. They think they're doing something righteous for God, and actually they're killing a man of God. They don't know what they're doing. Forgive them, Father. Uh, God tells us not to hold grudges against people that hate us. Uh, he tells us to love one another. So today we're going to be looking at being patient with each other. And we can be patient about a lot of things. We can be patient uh, waiting for the check to show up in the mail. Uh, waiting for something is always very hard. Um, for years, when my uh, kids were growing up, my little kids wanted a dog and a cat, but we always lived somewhere where you couldn't have dogs or cats. And finally, we were in a house where we could have a dog and a cat. And so we went and, and picked out the dog out of the litter of the, uh, the light-colored uh, Labrador retrievers, and it was the one that just ran over to us and jumped up on us, and she just chose us, and, and we took her home. And what name did we name her? We named her Patience because we had been very patient, waiting for years to have this puppy. And, and she grew up with, that, with my kids and just a wonderful, wonderful dog. Uh, always happy, always defending us, and always willing to play and have fun. We named her Patience because we had to be patient. Well, this kind of patience that Paul is talking about here is us being patient with one another. Why would we have to do that? Because sometimes we are just so annoying or irritating. Have you ever heard anybody say about a person, oh, well, that's just George? Because George is always saying something that shouldn't be said or inappropriate or doing something. And it's a sin, but everybody loves George. And they say, well, that's just George. And George does need to change, but all the other believers need to be patient with George and, and waiting for him to change. I've heard uh, stories from other people in the churches around here where people that have gone to church for years and the tension between them just grows and grows and finding one of them just said, that's it, and they just walk out. I can't take this person anymore. I won't be in the same room with that person. 
You know, God will probably put them as roommates in that city in heaven. <laughs> and then they'll love one another. They'll care for each other. They, will, they won't have this animosity. We're to be patient while other people grow. Do we all grow at the same speed? Uh, Paul, or the writer of Hebrews says, you know, you guys should have been teachers by now, but someone needs to teach you still. You haven't grown at all. And in the Corinthian church, they had people that were carnal Christians. They were baby Christians and, and carnal Christians. They just never grew up. And they're, they're still like little infants. And um, we need to be patient with people. And we need to bear with one another. So let's look at this word patience. It's an amazing word. And it means this. The word is makaruthumia. And it's made up of two words. The first word is makos. And it means long. And the other word is thumos. And it means rage or fury or anger. So you have the word long and you have the word fury and rage. And what it, take, what it means is you take a long time till you reach that point of fury and anger and rage. So, there might be a mountain in a country, a big, tall, pointy mountain. And maybe that mountain has not erupted for hundreds of years. And all of a sudden it gets to the point where it just does. And we're seeing that all over the world now. That's another sign that things are getting close. These amazing volcanoes erupting. And all of a sudden the volcano erupts. And that's th what this word means. That means to just erupt and explode. Explosions are never good. Uh, they always cause a lot of damage and harm. Um, when we were little, we used to love to shake up a bottle of pop and give it to our friend. Hey, when you want a Coke? <laughs> and they opened it up and <laughs> because we shook it all up. There was the college I went to, the Christian college, one of the guys that was uh, taught world history, um, great man of God, but they said he was like a little kid when they'd get in these board meetings and he just wanted to lighten things up, and he did that every now and then. He would shake a can of soda and give it to somebody. <laughs> yeah, college board meetings. Keep everything light and happy. But that's what the word means. It means to just take a very long time to finally explode. Have you ever heard the, the phrase, somebody has a short fuse? Yeah, they got a short fuse and, you know, it's a stick of dynamite. And maybe the fuse is about a quarter inch long. As soon as you touch a match to it, it explodes. And then you see really long fuses, you know. We've seen that in movies where all the big kegs of powder and they'll have fuses going and it'll just take forever to get that, for that fuse to get there. And that's the way God wants us to be with each other. It, he wants us to take forever and, and not, not get angry and not explode all over people. This word long in Ephesians, uh, or in Revelation 21, is talking about how big the city of the New Jerusalem is. It's 1,500 miles long and wide and high. That's really long, 1,500 miles. Uh, Paul was told by God when, when he got saved, God gave Paul an assignment to go witness to the Gentiles, and that was going to be far away, a long ways away, God told him. And then uh, when the rich man died, in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, when he went to Hades, he could look over and he could see Lazarus way over in Abraham's bosom. It was a long ways away, very long ways. So God is telling us, I want you to go a long ways with your other believers before getting mad at them. That's what it means. And how angry is this talking about? This is really angry. In Acts 19, Paul was preaching, and he was saying, don't worship other gods. And all these little silver idols you're all running around with. Uh, don't worship those. You worship God. Well, the guys that made those silver idols and made all their living and money off of making those silver idols, oh, man, they got so mad. They just exploded. And in Acts 19, verse 28, it says, when they heard what Paul was preaching, they became enraged. 
And when they went out, they filled the whole city into confusion, and they rushed at them because they were enraged, and they grabbed them, and they were on the ground. They just drug them on the ground before the magistrates there because they were so livid and angry and mad. We're supposed to take a long, long time before we get to that, that mad. And it's the church at Corinth um, was a very worldly church. They had so many problems. And Paul said, you know, when I get back to you, I'm going to come and visit you again. When I do there, or when I get there, you know what I'm afraid I'm going to find? I'm afraid I'm going to find you guys are quarreling. You're just arguing about this and that. And I'm going to find that, that this group is jealous of this group. And this leader, this teacher, he's jealous of the other teacher. And I'm going to find that you guys are angry with one another. He uses this word. And I'm going to find that you guys are hostile. You slander people. You gossip about other Christians. And you're conceited. And you're disorderly. <laughs> he didn't want to find that. He didn't want to find that they were angry. In Galatians, it talks about the works of the flesh, the sinful nature that we're born with. And fits of anger are one of those. Idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, all things that happen in churches. That is inbred into all of us. We're born with that sinful nature. Fits of anger. And then um, it's, it's called wrath in Ephesians 4.31. This wrath that wells up within us. Let all this wrath be put away from you. So this exploding like anger. <clears throat> in my single days, um, I graduated from frozen meals in the microwave. Because I did all my shopping at night, and I would go at night, and I would start to head down the frozen meal section. And they cordoned it off with yellow tape, and they were doing the floors, and I wasn't allowed to go there. And I thought, I'm going to starve this week because that's where I get all my food. And they would graciously come over, what, you know, and of course they spoke Spanish. And, I was, and whatever they brought back, I was thankful, okay, work in the microwave. But then I graduated to actually cooking something, so I was going to make boiled eggs. So... I'm boiling the water, and the water's not boiling. It's just been on high for a long time. And I think, you know, I think I heard that a, a, you boil water with salt. It'll boil really quick. So I took some salt and just dumped the salt. As soon as I dumped the salt, it goes. <laughs> I thought, well, that works. But I guess you put the salt in when you start heating it. <laughs> you don't put it in at, at a certain point because it's just boiled and splashed all over the place, hot water. It just, like, exploded. And recently, I saw this volcano in Spain, and it was shooting out these huge balls of fire. And it showed one, and it was, it was like, the, you know, like a big bowling ball. It was big, and it was rolling down this hillside. And, and they were filming it all the way down, and it finally stopped, and they went and looked at it, and this thing was like glowing. When people blow up and erupt, it's dangerous. It's harmful. Somebody can get hurt. <clears throat> I saw somebody blow up the other day when we were at Lake Tahoe and we were eating our lunch and I was eating at a picnic table and the kids were done and they were playing and Melody was across from me and I had Bolt. And when you have Bolt, our dog Bolt, she's named Bolt for a reason. She bolts when she wants to go somewhere. When she sees the cat, she bolts. When she sees another dog, she bolts and you better hold on. So I always tell them, you put that strap around your wrist, and so if it, it won't get ripped out of your hand that way. So I'm sitting there, and I finish my meal, and I got Bolt in my hand holding her. And without warning, she bolted. And when she did, I could feel, I mean, just immediate jerk, and I just thought, hold on. And I held on, and she kept going, and I'm on a picnic bench, and here I go. And I think... I realize I'm falling. There's nothing to grab onto. The only thing that's going to break my fall is the ground. And the only thing I could think is don't hit my head on the ground. Don't let my head bounding off the ground. So I just concentrated on that. And in the midst of all that, Bolt was gone. And she was going after this other dog. She wants to play with the dogs. She doesn't bite them or anything. She just loves to play with the dog. So. 
I hit the ground and I'm thinking, oh, my head didn't hit. I just worked it out so my head didn't hit. Thank God. And then I hear the man yelling and he's screaming. And he's yelling a melody. And he's, he's swear one swear word after another. He exploded in anger. And then I hear, then I hear the kids. The kids are there. And they're, they're yelling. And the guy's yelling. I'm trying to get up. It's not easy. <laughs> I felt like a turtle or a beach whale or something. So I, I finally get up and, and I get over there. And as soon as I see the guy standing there and the guy looks at me, and then I'm looking at Melody and say, what, is, what happened? What's going on? And I'm ready to talk to the guy. Don't talk like that around my kids. I'm sorry about my dog. And they already have the dog. And he looks at me and he just picks his dog up and he just threw it in the back of his SUV and closed it and, and sped away. And I said, what happened? She said, when I got over there, his dog was just standing there and Bolt was, wanted to play with it. And he's got his hand on his hip telling her, I'm going to kill your dog. You back off right now. I'm going to shoot him. And here's the dog. Here's my wife. Here's my three kids running up behind him. And he's going to shoot a dog. He's going to shoot a bullet with them in the background. <laughs> I'm all for concealed carry. But there's something wrong here. And he had an FBI t-shirt on. Uh, I, I thank God. I thank God that God protected us from the anger of this man. He was so livid. And a little bit later, we're on the beach. And I've got Bolt right here. And down the beach, a couple comes, and they got a black lab. And the black lab, Bolt, first Bolt sees the black lab, and Bolt says, yeah, play, play, play. And she's trying, no, 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 and I'm pulling, you know. And you start scratching her neck. I've learned that. And it's just like food, other dogs, cats, nothing matters. Don't stop until I tell you to. <laughs> so I'm scratching her neck, and she's okay. And then I look, and I hear the lady yelling, and here comes the black lab. And I think, okay, they just want to play. Maybe they'll play. I think Melody said something. Maybe they'll play together, you know, have a good time. Well, I was trying to get Bolt in the water, and black lab's a water dog. And, and then I look, and here's the lady running after, you know, saying, you know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And Melody's saying, don't worry, don't worry. And the dog comes over, and they're sniffing each other. And then the lady grabs the lab and pulls it away. And I didn't think about it until later. The same situation. Here came a dog with my tethered leash dog. And I thought, oh, it wants to come and play. And, and uh, so they took their dog, and everything was fine. And they were apologetic, and we were apologetic, and nothing happened. But that wasn't so with this other man. This other man was putting us in a spot where if he would have shot our dog, I can imagine, just imagine, that one of our kids would have ran at that man. Just that, that would have been something they never would have forgot. What if one of those boys did charge that man, thinking of all the stuff that could have happened, and he would have shot one of those boys? Because of his anger, he exploded in rage. If he is FBI, he needs to quit. He's in the wrong job. Willing to shoot somebody in a Nevada State Park with people and children all over the place? Let a bullet fly? Bad. Anger can be so harmful and deadly and hurtful. God says, please don't be like that. Please be patient. When people annoy you, when people just drive you crazy, would you please just be calm and be patient with them? Because I am patient with them. Look how patient I am with you. <laughs> it's patient with us. We need to be patient with one another. And then um, in the Old Testament, <coughs> God, uh, God makes God is one who is slow to anger. It says that over and over. He's one that's slow to anger. He wants us to be slow to anger. Solomon writes in Proverbs, he says, it's very good sense if you're slow to anger. It makes good sense to be that way. Um, whoever is slow to anger has great understanding. <laughs> but he that is, has a hasty temper or a short fuse, he exalts folly. Oh, he just makes folly out to be the greatest thing ever. 
because he has a short fuse. Uh, a hot-tempered man, he stirs up strife. And that's what that man did. He was hot-tempered, and he was stirring up strife in me. I'm glad he drove away because I was not afraid of him. He needed to be told. And if he would have done anything, I would have called the sheriff right there, and, and he would be in trouble. But, but why is he stirring up all the strife? Were the people with the black lab, we were just all laughing, and, oh, okay, you know, fun dogs. We didn't need to be all mad and angry. We weren't hot-tempered. But he who is slow to anger, he quiets contention. Here's contention, quiets it. Afterwards, with the issue with the dog, my wife says, a, a, a soft answer turns away wrath. And she was just, it, we're sorry, we're, so, we're sorry, you know. I just pulled my husband over on the ground. He's still on the ground, you know, when I wasn't there yet. And uh, was the guy like, oh, is he okay? Oh, no, no, it was all about him and his anger. So God wants us to be patient. He wants us to be very slow to anger. Uh, Nehemiah talks about how the people just sinned and sinned and sinned. So how did God re respond to them when they just would not quit? Um, Nehemiah 9.16. But they and our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their neck. They did not obey your commandments. They refused to obey and they were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them, but they stiffened their neck, and they appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. So how did God treat them? But you are a God ready to forgive. You are gracious, you are merciful, and here's the word, you are slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and you did not forsake them, even when they made themselves a golden calf, you still loved them. You still showed them your great mercy. That's how God was with us. That's how he wants us to be with others. And uh, this word patience is in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. That's a characteristic of love, caring for one another more than ourselves. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5.14, it says to be patient with everyone, not just believers, with everyone. And everyone is all the ones that we don't have patience with. See, I just don't have patience with that person anymore. God says be patient with everyone. And in Galatians 5, it's the fruit of the Spirit. All the good things that are the characteristics and quality of God, God's Spirit. One of them is patience. And God wants us to be patient. And that makes it possible for us because it's what the Holy Spirit does inside of us. He gives us power. He gives us the ability that we never had before to not be angry with people and to put up with people. So that, that gives us hope. God is like that. And then he wants us to bear with one another. I think that's such a a good word, I guess, to bear when people are unbearable. When, when they're unbearable, we need to bear with them. This is the same idea as the word patience. This word means to put up with people. It means to bear with people. It means to endure with people. This word is also used for enduring persecution and tribulation. Some Christians can make us feel like we're being persecuted and um, there, there's plenty of people that I have to endure with and bear with and put up with that, that are slanderous and, uh, well, slanderous, making things up that aren't true. And I have to bear with them. I have to endure them. I have to tolerate them. You hear a lot about being tolerant today. And what you hear is, well, we need to be tolerant of other people's sin. No, that's not what God says. God says, oh, is sin bad? <laughs> We need to be tolerant of other believers, maybe that are sinning against us, or they are sinning. And if it's not us, it's some other way, or they're just annoying. We're to tolerate them and, and never stop. We're to bear with people. Uh, it's not talking about allowing Christians to go on in sin or anything like that. There's a place where um, you exercise church discipline. That is in the Bible, and a, and a Christian refuses to stop openly sinning, that that you know, church needs to do that. 
but we need to tolerate people. You know, we're all different, uh, aren't we? Kind of. We all look different. We all think and act differently in a lot of ways. And um, I always think of shields when you go look at the, the tropical fish, especially. They're all so different. It's different sizes and shapes and flat and round and thin and tubular and colors. Just amazing. They're all different. But every one of them needs to tolerate the other one. We need to tolerate each other. Some people just are very matter of fact, and they're not real artsy, and they're, they don't want to just labor on and on and on talking about something. Just give me the facts and be done with it. Tell me what to do, and I'll okay, we'll do it, and you're done. And another person says, oh, let's, let's spend a lot of time on Let's study this. Let's really work on this, and we'll, we'll make it even better. And, and the person that wants it done now is just gets so annoyed with that person. And that person's annoyed with that person. Why don't you just let me be me and be myself? I used to know somebody that, that they always said, well, you have to be like me. I, I'm not, and I'm not going to be like you. I'm going to be who God made me. I'm not talking about sin or anything like that. But he made me the personality and the person that I am. He made each one of us who we are. And we all have to learn to get along together. <laughs> and that's bearing with each other. That's tolerating each other. In the Bible, it says that for a long time I have held my peace, God says, and I have kept still and restrained myself. He restrained himself from Israel from punishing them. Um, Jesus says, how long shall I put up with you? And that's this word. He looked at the Jewish people that did not receive him as their Messiah. And he says, oh, I've wanted to I wanted you to receive me so badly. How long am I going to have to put up with you guys? Huh, a long time. Oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? There was somebody that needed to be healed, and he said, how long do I got to put up with your unfaithfulness, your your." your lack of faith to believe that I'm God and I can heal him. How long do I have to put up with you? Just bring the child to me. And he brought him to him, and Jesus took care of him and healed him. There's a similar passage in Colossians, as we found Colossians and Ephesians are very similar. And i like to finish up by looking at these two verses. Um, Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. And it says this, to put on then, and that's something that we all did this morning. We all put on clothes, and that's what it means, just to put something on. Cover yourself up. Colossians 3.12. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. And that's our calling. It's saying the same thing as Ephesians. Walk worthy of your calling. You have this calling. You're chosen of God. You're holy of God. You're beloved. God loves you. And now this is what I want you to do. I want you to put on compassionate hearts towards one another. I want you to be kind to each other. I want you to have humility. And that's the word in Ephesians 4.2. I want you to have meekness. That's your gentleness in Ephesians 4.2. I want you to have patience. And that's the word in Ephesians 4.2. Humility, meekness, patience. Bearing with one another. And that's the word too. Bearing with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, so here we go, somebody complaining against that other person and people would come to me. I have a complaint against that guy and you need to listen to me and this guy does this and that and that and this. Well, when we have a complaint against somebody else, another believer, we're to forgive each other. And why? Because the Lord has forgiven you. So you must also forgive. Peter says, how many times? Can you give me the number so I know when not to forgive? <laughs> well, 70 times 7, oh, now i got to do math. 70 times 7, isn't that a lot? Uh, 490? 490 times i got to forgive that person? How long can my anger hold out on this? Remember, it's the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. He is in us, and he enables to do, uh, to do everything he wants us to do. He says, be patient, bear with one another, 
And we can do that because he makes us able. And so we have no excuse. But we, we're all growing and we're all learning. We're all following Christ. And we need to be patient with one another. And when we see sinful behavior or wrong thoughts or whatever in other Christians, we need to be forgiven. We need to pray for one another. We need to be kind to each other in all circumstances. So, very simple. Can't we all just get along? Tolerate one another, put up with each other. And God gives us the ability to do that. And when we can do that in this world, people will look at us and say, you're like a bunch of bright, shining lights. Look at that place. You're going to see the light glowing out of it. When we um, saw Sheila yesterday, it was hard um, seeing what happens to our, to our worn out bodies. But one thing I noticed, and I noticed it right away, when we talked about the Lord and Bible and how God is and good God is to us, her eyes were bright and shiny. They were just bright. They had life in them. And it was so good to see that. I, I saw the rest of you, you know, you, it's so, you, you know, it's just hard to see. But her eyes were bright and shiny. And in the inside, you know, we're believers and we have God's spirit in us. And he can make us bright and shiny under any circumstance and any condition. We need to be patient and be bright, shiny lights in this world. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you so much for your great love. Thank you, Lord, that you tell us how to be. Thank you, Lord, that you give us the power to be that way. And we do ask as your children, Father, help us to grow, help us to mature, help us to listen to you and this message and your word. Help us to be patient and endure one another. So just bless us as a body, everyone that listens and hears. We do pray, Lord, that we'll follow you with all of our hearts. And thank you, Lord, that you are coming again someday to take us home where we won't have to put up with these sinful natures anymore. And we just give you all the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.